Thank you for coming on, James. Um, like I said, my podcast is now video, so thank you for redoing this, and uh, I'm very excited to get started with you. James, you It's my pleasure, Jake, and, and uh, I, I, any time, obviously. If you weren't happy with the original quality, by all means, I don't mind doing it again. Yeah, thank you, and uh, by all accounts, uh, you're doing well um with yourself i know you had a little bit of a cold but uh you did contract uh coronavirus so just well, that, that, I'm, that i'm aware of no <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm i i shouldn't laugh about it but obviously i'm still breathing and i'm still here so uh until we get you know like testing for people that have had it i may have had it months ago but we'll never we won't know for a while yeah so you're doing okay on that front, obviously. Well, as well as I can be, I think I think everybody's got certain ailments. I've got my allergies are probably at a heightened state, but that's probably because of the the, the heightened uh, uh, hormonal response with probably being a little bit more anxious, a little bit more on edge, uh, and obviously from what I've talked about on multiple platforms, we can't control the future, so. I'm trying to stay in the moment. Uh, obviously, if somebody gets a little bit too blasé about the future in terms, I had somebody today um, say, "Oh, my my life's been ruined by by the virus." Thinking, well, that's technically not true, um, and you blaming something that you have no control over for other internal things within your life. It's like, well, you probably had a bearing and maybe that other person has used that as an excuse or uh, a a kind of an escape kind of thing. Well, I'll I'll use this as my escape module to get out of this situation. And it could have been 99 other problems, obviously, to quote the the Jay-Z song. But I think people are either on two ends of the spectrum when it comes to where we're at now. Obviously, you've got people that are bored and want to go back to normality. Some want to go back to normality because they're frustrated. And I think, obviously, you've got the other people on the other side of the spectrum of this is going to enable me to do to either get things that I want, I've wanted to do for a long, long time to do it. And obviously, you've got the ones that are, I'm going to stay in the moment. I'm going to do as best as I can. I'm going to take every day as it comes and live it to the best of ability. Obviously, I've kind of been in both camps. So I've kind of, when people have said, I'm bored, I'm frustrated, I've got used to it now. I was kind of in denial and a little bit unaccepting of the situation five weeks ago. And I think I've slowly, through reaching out to other people, uh, seeking out um obviously help with mental health with the right authorities with that i've got slowly got better and i've kind of got an even keel whereas okay i'm going to have my good and bad days but everybody's going to have their good and bad days uh and obviously roll with the punches in terms of well if it's a bad day quote unquote i'm good that's the best i can do today and i'm just going to try and do the best i can and that brings me to a perfect setup about what you do, you're a transformation coach, and you um, go and help people, obviously, with their mental state, but also their physical state and nutrition when it comes to only having one limb. You have femoral femoral dysplasia. I interviewed you uh, one other time and still hasn't got it easy to say that. Um, but so what I want you to do, if you don't mind, just explain to the best of your ability uh, what femoral dysplasia is. To put it into context, Jake, uh, femoral dysplasia is, to give you a visual sense, I have a prosthetic limb like any other amputee. However, mine is a congenital, congenital I'll call it quote unquote deformity where I have uh, had the limb not grow to its full, uh, I'll call it potential, 
uh, of a, of a no, what would be a normal able-bodied person. So I'm I'm missing my f- femur. Yeah, yeah, right femur, which is the top half portion of the thigh. And I've got a small tibia and fibula, which we'd normally find in the bottom half of the leg. So my, I've got the opposite of a normal amputee. So I've got the bottom portion of my leg attached to my hip. So I don't have uh, the knee or the upper extremity of the leg, if that makes sense to people. And I also should say, you're the owner of the Mindset Athlete Podcast. So not only do you see and coach and have clients of um, – different abilities, but you allow them to have an audio platform that is free for them to listen to. During this time, it's probably gotten more views than it usually has. So that's probably one of the upsides of this pandemic that people have more time to listen to your podcast, right? Well, I wouldn't just say I wouldn't just say mine, Jake. I would say no, a number of platforms are probably seeing an increase in in their uptake and, and their uh, listenership uh, during the last three four months. Mine, I think it depends. Certain episodes, yes. Some have turned out to be probably a life uh, and a kind of uh, a lifesaver for people and kind of a godsend because they Facebook has reminded me. Well, this is what you put out at this particular time. Like, okay, we'll reshare it. And, and a lot of them have been very uh, instrumental uh, looking at the mind in a different perspective. So I've had clients uh, tell me that they've gone to listen to shows, uh, different ones in particular. I was like, okay. And then I, obviously I'll quiz them as we go, as we progress into to, to this new normal. I said, well, what, what intrigued you about that episode in particular? And, and to kind of do like market research as to, okay, instead of me interviewing people that I want to learn more about, what can I do to best serve the audience from people that I already know and already within my um, inner circle and, and kind of go, well, this is what you want to look at. This is what you want to target. So through my personal group that I run for free, so people get a little bit more substance than that is on my personal page i'm going a little bit i'm going to delve in a slightly probably three four five steps deeper in terms of okay you want me to target this particular topic we'll deep dive in it you can ask as many questions as you want and i can obviously go and do future videos from there and so so i think i did one along the lines last week at looking at the three um, major exercises as, a, as an amputee you should be doing or you should already be doing and obviously I talked about it on my profile but I obviously showed the guys within the private group what they were and then obviously if you had a question as to I can't do that one right now what can I do instead I messaged them privately we'll try this instead so I go a little bit step further in terms of it's probably the group is probably a go between people that don't know me or don't know me that well. So people that work with me and it's kind of a go between to kind of give them a bit of a sample to what it'd be like to work with me. And then ultimately that's with anything you're working with people. So if they don't see value in that product, they're not going to invest or they're going to go to somebody else. But ultimately that's fine as well, because if you, as long as you are seeking out, the improvement it doesn't matter if you're doing it yourself with me or one of my peers it, uh, it, it whatever is going to make you change, go from the state that you're in presently to a better version of yourself is it has to sit better it has to sit well with you in your gut it doesn't matter what i think ultimately because my um opinion or my lack better lack of judgment shouldn't weigh on you at, at, at all. So you've obviously interviewed athletes um, and other athletes that are differently able and nutrition coaches and all sorts of people that you think are beneficial for people to hear from. Is there one episode that you would suggest 
people to listen to right now that pertains, pertains to the coronavirus, not directly, possibly, because he didn't do it with that intention if he did it beforehand. But do you think there's one episode that might hit a string that might make people a little bit more comfortable in their skin with the coronavirus? Mm, that's a great question, Jake. Um, comfortable in their own skin. There's probably a multi. There's probably a, a little bit more than one episode. Uh, the one that ultimately it took me a lot to get over emotionally because we went really, 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 really deep into it. Uh, would have been episode two hundred and two, I believe, where we looked at what mental things you could be to able to able to implement right now to be comfortable in this particular position that we're in and i recorded that probably about four or five weeks ago so we're right in the midst of it so uh we probably went to certain areas that i didn't mentally want to go to but obviously you can't uh, dictate where somebody's thought process is going you can't manipulate it from that so it took a probably maybe a week maybe two weeks to get over mentally just of the the emotional outpouring of kind of okay let's open a can of worms in terms of where i'm not i'm all right now because ultimately i i dictate what i consume from be it news uh, social media and that whereas probably back then I wasn't as as aware of some of the things that I was doing so so when he brought up um, ultimately he knew somebody that was two people removed who died from the disease unfortunately I probably put an, a feeling towards that and I don't even know that person whereas that's just a thought okay, emotionally, it's not very nice that thousands and thousands of people have died. At, at the moment, no, none of my family has been affected by that. So I should be grateful for that, that I am able to speak to them wherever they are in the world and they're still here. So I think, I think if people can kind of think of it from, I know it's simplistic, but it keeps you in the here and now. You don't think of what if what if this was to rise um and go into kind of that negative thinking because ultimately that's kind of a spiral in itself so i think social media is difficult but you have some control over that um obviously twitter no so i've removed myself from that from that platform completely until obviously we get to a new sense of normality where we may have a vaccine for this and then people will kind of calm down a little bit and kind of be either not be uh, spewing hatred, um, scared, scared out of their wits and kind of going a little bit more human where you didn't care where something like this arose if as long as, long as it wasn't in your backyard, you were all right. So for, for argument's sake, Facebook, you have control over that. You can either mute people for a certain amount of time so you don't see you don't see their their feed or ultimately if they're not family and you could even go even further than that if it's a toxic in relationship from a family perspective if they're not serving you right now and you don't speak you don't you're not on terms with them from a speaking perspective why not remove them for now obviously you still have you have a connection with them from from a phone number perspective if you don't want to see that feed that's one way of doing it and and, and i've removed probably hundreds of people because like what's well, not serving me right now you are in a re negative headspace right now i don't want to see that i want to see stuff that's either f you know uh, sarcastic funny uh something i'm going to learn from upbeat it doesn't have to be always positive, but it's going to make me be in either equilibrium, uh, balanced state, or it's going to be uplifting and kind of give me a little bit of sense of joy versus 
I, I know people are going to have their bad days, but really and truly, it doesn't matter if it was now or eight months ago. People ultimately do not care about your problems. And I think you putting it out there and airing your laundry, does it serve you? Probably not, because ultimately you're reading that to yourself, and which is very detrimental from an emotional standpoint, but also a psychological one, which I've obviously learned a lot about over this coming period in terms of when you actually use negative self-talk, it's, I think, what was it? Uh, scientifically four to seven times more potent than somebody else telling you that so if you can kind of get away from that that position straight away you're going to be in a better position so my group we we kind of designed it well I didn't want to make it a support group because there's an from an empty perspective there's you can count them on probably on that multiple hands it's like well mine will be something of uh i won't call it support but kind of a vehicle to expand on your knowledge of fitness nutrition and mindset yes it's a support mechanism for you to be able to ask questions but it's not one for kind of well i'm in this predicament here what can i do it's something that's more uh, to ask questions of, of kind of, instead of kind of, well, I've got this problem, what do I do? Here's a problem, here's a solution. And film all this picture, at least for you, is something that you had have your whole life. And your outlook on it has changed throughout life. And you had a more mature look on it now than you have had on it previous years. Let's say someone, a teenager, anyone that's not as mature as you in your 30s. How do you get them to look positively or not, not negatively at this virus and don't blame the virus for not being able to work out because then you're going to blame once you blame the virus you're going to blame the fact that you only have one leg and then it's going to filter out to your, the rest of your life. How do you make sure that that moment that you have excuse me, of negativity. I'm guessing it's okay to have that moment because we're always going to have emotions that we don't like to feel and we're going to allow them to, us to feel them, but we don't want it to be prolonged. So what advice would you give to someone who's not as mature in life experience as you are, and how do they get through this time? Well, this, this is one, Jack, uh, Jake, that somebody's told me, and obviously this show hasn't come out yet because uh, I've had technical difficulties with it, but he, he kind of used the analogy of using from a, a, a negative thought as a bird landing on a tree. I've let it come in. Obviously, the bird's going to, or for you, you know, it's going to going to land on the feeder or go to the bird bath. It's going to land. It's going to take its moment to either eat food, drink water, and then it's going to fly off. If you can think of a negative emotion like that, as let it come in and let it drift out just as quickly as it comes. Obviously, it's more difficult. It's more, it's more difficult to put it in to practice than I'm talking about. And I, I still occasionally have those, those doubts in terms of uh, it's not dwelling upon like you said and letting it consume you because then when it takes hold, it's more and more difficult to unleash that beast. And psychology will talk about, um, you know, the wolf or thing or the, the raging dog, black dog in terms of what would be associated to PTSD. That is 
a emotion that you've kind of let become a feeling and it's a lot harder to get rid of a feeling than it is an emotion because uh, if you go a step further than that from the emotion and you step back from this and I know it's quite guruesque talking about this you take back you take a step back and actually think of it rationally and logically as a human being we are our feel we aren't our emotions we are human beings it we we are we're not sad we're not frustrated we're not angry we're not happy we're none of those 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 are uh, a reaction to a situation or an event and ultimately if you latch upon that emotion it becomes a feeling so in a sense you're just exemplifying a learned behavior that you've learned over how how old you are from um from when you were a child so you are in a sense um very much like a computer program you're being programmed into exhibiting characteristics and, and traits that your parents are giving off so i was re i'm reading a book um what's the name of it i can't think of the name um if i can remember i'll i'll, I'll give you a picture the, for, for the book and it talked about if you've got siblings and you are and you supersede them and your mother has a kind of a negative emotion on their, your face you're going to associate that as i don't want to make my mom feel this way ever again and anytime you do step outside of that comfort zone even as you get older and you're not in the same household that's your glass ceiling as oh i can't feel any more different than this marker if you use like a thermometer i can't go over i don't know for example zero degrees fahrenheit because of what's happened long distance in the past so if you can could be able to uh and this is something i'll probably touch base with you as we go as i get further into the book i think i thought it was a great perspective as okay it's got a point it, and it gets you to start qu questioning and thinking differently in terms of okay how do i feel about relationships how do i feel about money how do i feel about myself or you listen to this watching this how do you feel about because in in a, in a true sense of coming back to what i mentioned earlier of people being not comfortable staying inside is because their external uh, appreciation is external it's not they they're not comfortable in their own skin they're not comfortable uh wrestling with that nobody i think no most people aren't are wrestling with you know when you kind of got to have that momentary uh, at peace with yourself and it's now 24 hours a day it's a, lot, it's a lot harder to do than okay uh if you've got escapisms with school an extra curricular activity sport a relationship at the moment depending on where you are in the world and, and uh, depending on what state you are in the US you have a little bit more quote unquote freedoms than other people but in true sense of freedom you you you're not in, you're not imprisoned right now it's 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 perspective i i can in the uk i i'm allowed to go out more than i was where i live uh than two weeks ago but i'm not i'm going to lower the risk of coming in contact with people if i can because ultimately on somebody put this on facebook what happens if the people that contracted the virus that never went outside the house that's a choice there's no there's no direct correlation if you were to go outside that you wouldn't have caught it as well so it would it be an invisible you have no control over if you catch it and you get symptoms or if you catch it and you don't so you got to live probably the best of your ability i know it's it's difficult to be able to do that and and you talked about teenagers i think some people are probably better positioned than you think um 
I think if those that have disabilities think of it from an outside perspective, you face adversity. The actual difficulty and when actually I thought about it, because I didn't I've faced multiple adversity throughout my life. But if you actually think of it yourself, your day to day struggle for however long you've been on this earth is more difficult than the last three to four months. If you think of it from that perspective, just having to deal with the day to day struggles that that life shows, or obviously with you having cerebral palsy, there's going to be worse days than others. You not being able to go outside and do things that you want to do is no big. It's, I think given the grand gesture of it isn't a big deal when you think of it as well look what i have to overcome on what was a normal day-to-day basis that you kind of humbly look to ignore and that brings me to my next question great segue i've talked to people in the differently abled or disability community of recent and they said, you know what, for us, it's, it's a blessing in disguise because now people are able to see what we've been going through all these years and being able to empathize with us because, like you said, this to us should be a less, less of a big deal because when you think about it, even if it's on the same level, as the coronavirus, we've overcome these challenges for you, federal disposition for me, CP, for our entire lives. And this has only been a few months. So when you look at it from people that don't have disabilities, from their perspective, Do you think ultimately they'll be more empathetic and respectful to us after this virus because they're experiencing an exclusion from the outside world that we've already experienced? Yes and no. I think the people that have have, have got to grips with it, yes, because they've got a sense of this is now my new normal. Uh, this gives me a sense to grow, to learn, and to connect with different people. Uh, the people that I mentioned, for mentioned before, that are frustrated, uh, want to get to back to normality, and that doesn't matter if they're able-bodied or disabled. Them, it's probably a 50-50 split. It's a catch-22, probably not. Uh, when we get back to some sense of normality, I'd like to hope that that um, kindness, uh, nature, and, and ultimately a sense of camaraderie in terms of we were all in it together will stay, but only time will tell. And you work with all different types of people in, in this transformation program in terms of ages. I presume. And there's got to be times where they tell you, I was unhappy with the way I was treated um, today or a week ago or whatever. I personally find it better, but not easy at all to go up to that person if they have value and say, well, you're treating me with disrespect in my opinion. Why don't we try to change that? How do you get them to have the confidence? And do you think they'll have the confidence to do that more? Because they realize that they were able to adapt to this coronavirus and kind of change their ways based on that. So if they could change their ways based on that, 
they don't have the ability to go up to someone and say, I'm, I'm not happy about it because, because you said this and because I did that, I faced the coronavirus and I changed for the better or for my need. I'm able to now face anything that I face. Well, I think, Jay, you've got to go a step further than that because ultimately confronting somebody based on their opinions or beliefs, and some, yes, you, can have a, you could have a, a common sense discussion and give your take on what you've said as being uh, hurtful uh, and kind of degrading, but obviously for others, they'll love that conflict and you'll get, you'll get no respite. And ultimately from an emotional standpoint, you're left with that damage and that baggage of getting frustrated and a sense of anger because you've been kind of thrust into this position of hatred. And then if you go away with that ill feeling, and that can stir with you for months. I was talking to a fellow amputee at the beginning of the, the lockdown in terms of helping me out in terms of, well, what 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 uh, baggage are you keeping holding on to deeply? And it'd be, be stuff that I was um, having to deal with from a okay social media perspective, but it's, it's virtually the same thing in terms of, uh, people giving you disrespect in terms of well they didn't see value in what you were doing. Yeah. I held on to that from say Christmas time or before Christmas up until say middle April, yeah. and still latching on to those sentiments of okay, they have um, run my name through the mud, things like that. Whereas I need to be able to disattach that sentiment. From that, I can't change that person's point of view based on where they're at at that particular time. If they were maybe closer towards me, I probably could maybe have a, uh, like I said, a, a discussion and kind of say, well, your perspective, I, I get. However, it's not serving to other people where you're coming at by um, kind of running me over with it kind of reversing over me from that if I use that analogy because ultimately I didn't say that it's you using little clip notes from my conversations with other people be it on a comment feed to kind of make your to kind of give substance to your argument whereas well that's not true and nor is that so where did I say that and be able to be able to step away from it and kind of Ultimately, and this is where, you know, content creators like you and myself need to be at the fore of that. You make content that polarizing that people that hate you are either not going to consume it or are not going to feel obliged to, to comment. Obviously, there are going to be some that do because they get a kick out of your, your, your response. And, but then on the other hand, you're going to bring people closer to it in your inner circle because they're going to love what you add to to their community and love to what that you bring to their life. So I think ultimately, and this would be my final point with this, you're always going to have your haters. It's it's how you feel about yourself should be the first and foremost and most important. So if you are comfortable in your own skin, you are comfortable the way you look, who is who is who is it for me to say any different as a coach? Is it for the external people in society or people in general? Obviously that's a work in progress for a lot of people, but that comes down to self-confidence, self-esteem and self-belief. You can't, you, you, and that's just, I think where people get it twisted is they think they lack these skill sets. You can't lack anything. You can lose the ability to have it, but you can regain it. And, and the, the analogy I like to use with clients and people I speak to is, can you lose a set of keys, Jake? Yes. But can you find those? Yes. You can. And if you, think, if, you, if you think of traits and characteristics that you have in the same fashion, 
you grow it. I wasn't, I, if we go back to when I was younger, I didn't have these skill sets when, when, when I was younger. I built upon them by people I surrounded myself with subconsciously because I didn't know what I was doing because it's a learned behavior. Well, I like this individual because uh, we have similar interests. So I'm going to hang out with you and say with my family. They had an old school set of, I call them morals and, and beliefs in terms of you need to work hard for the things that you get and you have a mindset of sink or swim. Obviously, as a, as a, as a child, I act like a sponge. I act the same way. And I think for me, and I'll be realistic with people watching and listening, it's only come to when we've hit this virus that I have not been able to, at first, comprehend, okay, this is something I've never faced before. However, I already have the skill sets. But I didn't, I didn't think like that. I thought like the rest of the population where, okay, let's go run out. Like I didn't do this, but just for argument's sake, let's go out and go we'll buy loads and loads of toilet paper and kind of go in a sheep mentality as follow the herd versus uh, what my coach has kind of um, said to be like a role model and a leader. You were either be the wolf or the hunter and you kind of take on another persona that you are you are comfortable with your own skin, you do not care what other people think, and you go out and serve other people, and you do it from that one. So I think over the last probably two, three weeks, I've done that. It's gone out to be able to, what can I do to serve somebody else to make their life better, and what can I do to show up? So obviously the, the anxiety is still there, but that's only because I'm in a position of mentally, I can't comprehend, is it anxiety or is it excitement? Because phys physiologically or from a physical standpoint, they, they show up as the same thing physically. You always feel the same way. So do I feel scared about the situation? Probably not because coming on your show, should bring me joy, should bring me excitement um, and doing other things of being able to speak to different people. Yes, yes a, a gut-wrenching feeling to have, but that's a good thing because ultimately if you didn't have some little bit of ounce of fear, you're not going to do it because it's like, well, what's the point? It's not diff it, this, is, this, this situation or scenario isn't difficult. Why am I going to come outside my comfort zone? Whereas if you look at it, I kind of test in the boundaries as what is, what is going to test me. And somebody did ask, how do I kind of do public speaking? I said, just start, just hit the, just hit the button on Facebook and start there. There's your bait, their ground. Look, I, okay. I'll make it sound easy, but I've done, done it uh, periodically for a certain amount of time, stopped, picked it up again. But, and I think that first couple, same with podcasting, is difficult because you either want to be in competition with somebody else, because be you know somebody that you look up to within that field, or you want to make it perfect. Whereas neither are serving you because ultimately you're either going to come very procrastinated and think, well, what's the point? Because I've only had, say for argument's sake, 10 people that have listened to it. You've not given it the consistency to let it build up and, and kind of get in the flow and people talk about it and, and people share in it. Just, just let it happen. It's, it's, not, it's probably easier now because obviously people, more and more people are listening and, and willing to tune into different things and thinking, well, okay, I quite like this person's approach to whatever topic it is. I'm going to keep tuning in and go from there. And same with Facebook Live. It's not going to be perfect from the very get-go. I know for sure, for sure, my podcast was not, uh, I'm not ashamed to say it. It's not, it wasn't the finished article three years ago. People do say, well, you're very well spoken, very eloquently spoken now. 
that's taken practice it's taken to be comfortable in my skin and to be comfortable in my own format to be able to do that and then when people say oh can you send me a set of questions okay i can do that but then that limits where it's going to go whereas if we had a little bit more off the cuff approach which i think you exemplify as well jake in terms of it's you don't know where the conversation is going to go and and where, where it could where the tangents are going to happen and if you kind of let that just happen and you don't force it it makes things a little bit easier yes there is structure because obviously you have a time frame but you can kind of not having to focus so much on the question but you pick on on the actual answers the person's giving and then be able to run with that we talked about the mental part of the virus and having a difference one thing that you focus on a tremendous amount as well as nutrition does your nutrition affect your mental state and if so what can people be doing to fuel their bodies that may have great positive energy especially during this time that they will really need when we're in a pandemic like this. I think absolutely. And I think obviously most people probably have, and if they haven't already, um, you're either not going to change or, or you haven't got around to seeing the value or the priority of doing it because ultimately the way that you eat is going to have an enormous amount of, of bearing on not just your physical state, but also your mental state. So people eating uh, mindlessly, I'll call it crap, but be it, you know, fast food, uh, if they're still going to, to fast food joints to get their food, uh, you having a tendency to eat cookies, crisps, and things like that. Yeah. It's high in salt, it's high, it's high in sugar, uh, if you're still consuming cereal for breakfast, you're virtually, and this was on, I think, the Food Channel yesterday here in the UK, and I think the the, the, the chef, um, Jamie Oliver, jumping on the bandwagon a little bit, because it was like, well, it's almost like eating a dessert for breakfast. It's like, well, it's only because the stuff is misleading or the marketing is designed towards the kids to make it as flashy and jazzy uh, as it, and in, as enticing as it can be where so the kid will kind of go well M mommy daddy i want this versus the other and i was no different as a child but i think the product has become more sugary as people's palates have got obviously a threat uh, kind of a, a tolerance for sugar i think they've put more and more in it to kind of uh saturate uh, to sat are you saturate people's appetite towards it because they've got a tolerance level that for probably when I was a kid 20 years ago was maybe down here to melt sugar content for people right in, in now that in 2020 is a hell is a hell of a lot higher so that sugar content probably be well I, I I'd have to probably do the the science behind it to see if that was the case but that's why people are wired in terms of you kind of go massive spike and then you kind of see people kind of, blah, 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 can't, I can't function in the afternoon. That's why. It, it's, it's, it's not, I'll use somebody's um, comment in my group from yesterday. He said, nutrition isn't rocket science. It's, it's energy in versus energy out. But I said to him, for most people, that's too difficult because they can't comprehend how they're eating, first and foremost, to this is how I'm going to feel a couple minutes later, a couple hours later, days later, months later, whereas he's a lot further along the line in terms of he's probably uh, he still can learn a little bit more, but probably an A student in terms of he knows what he's doing in terms of his nutrition. He knows what he's doing with his, with his fitness, but he could still improve upon that. But coming back to the question that you asked, what could people be better served to doing is obviously mindful of 
what you're doing along the lines of nutrition in terms of are you really hungry when you're going towards the kitchen or that's even before you, you you get towards the fridge the freezer or the store cupboards do i really need to eat or would i be better served to go to the to be if you do have an american style fridge freezer where you've got the, the ice machine and, and the drinks machine there would i be better to have a cold drink a drink uh, or go to the faucet uh, and get, get a drink versus having something to, to eat. However, on the other point with that, it's not feeling guilty if you do have something to eat because you actually did need to have some sort of snack. Obviously, the healthier the better. But if you had um, a portion of chocolate, it's not making yourself feel guilty after the fact. Well, I shouldn't have had that. I, I feel bad for eating that. I should have had something better. If you wanted it and you get the satisfaction of it being what I coined yesterday as a guilty pleasure or you have it as a treat or it's once in a blue moon or it's once in a week and you get satisfaction out of having something that is now a family occasion that some lot of people are doing now they're having a a weekly pizza night or uh, some a weekly chinese and you make that an occasional thing that it's we're gonna have celebrate this for it's something different that's an entirely different subject altogether but that's looking at differentiating the two if you can eat and this is the probably the take home of the 80 20 model if you can eat well 80 percent of the time and 20 the other 20 percent you look to probably treat yourself but it's 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 treats of that nature is like one one meal out of 28 or however many you have no 20 21 and it's one meal don't beat yourself up on it's one meal enjoy it uh i i don't um feel guilty if I have uh, well there's less and less stuff in the house now but once it's gone I don't feel bad I don't I have no I have no inclination to go to the sh to the suit to the store to get it because it's like well, what I'm not what why would I want to do that in the first place because that puts me at greater risk of getting COVID so that's that's enough of a motivation to kind of well it's not there now I've eaten it. Oh, well, yes, the body was craving that at that particular time. And it's kind of way, out, outweighing the positive versus the negatives and kind of looking at it kind of in a, in a mindful way of enjoying every meal as you do it. So being able to have a time where depending on how your household is set up, it's more, it's more difficult than, for other people than others. It's having an orientation to what you would do for either Thanksgiving, Christmas, and things like that, where you would come out of the living room and eat in the dining room and being able to disconnect from the outside world, be it the computer, tablet, phone, TV, and be connected with your family on that basis obviously if you're by yourself it's trying to 100 percent concentrate and focus on even if you can do it and i think i managed to do it what from one meal focus on every mouthful that you have and being grateful for well this is a nice meal. obviously if you made it yourself it's even better because you get the satisfaction of i've made a nice meal now i get to eat it and, and looking to be able to do that. Same with people with baking. If you get a satisfaction out of eating it, uh, out of making it, and I know I've heard a lot of people say we feel guilty that we're eating loads of it, but you're still doing a skill you weren't doing before. You're, you're enhancing your culinary skills enormously. I, I said only last year I can't bake. I had to, I had to do it from a work perspective because I was working in a school was able to do it. So if you can dispel that can't kind of way of thinking, 
and think of okay let's look at the the if i was able to do it and and move ever present towards i can do this for the better i think i seen a great one on i think it was facebook today somebody shared a a tiktok um from a little kid going to going back i i it must be somewhere where it's going back to school him doing affirmations going to school and it probably like i don't know no no older than five years old talking about i'm smart i'm brave i'm confident and i'm relaying that in terms of it is subconsciously brainwashing yourself but it's kind of what i try and teach certain clients of you've got to be able to act how you want to think sometimes versus obviously when you get into a positive state you think how you want to act so you kind of done a reverse engineer it as to kind of get your mind to think well i am these things so let me act in a certain way and yeah that's great i think that's where we should end uh today because it leaves a great take home point for the viewers thank you james for doing this and uh stay happy and healthy it's my pleasure